We all explore, every day, small ways and big. We find ourselves, reinvent ourselves, define ourselves, publish our lives. We want to squeeze all the life out of life and hit pause on moments we wish could last. For all our searching, it's rare to find time to think and talk about the big questions of life. About faith and reason and God and meaning. But exploring is good. We're built for it. We all have times we feel disconnected, uninspired, and isolated. In order to transform our routine, we must experience something greater than ourselves. Something that reconnects us to God, our community, and our purpose. Rooted is a life-changing, experiential discipleship process. This is a concept an American church learned from a Kenyan church to inspire people to passionately follow Jesus and change the world. It's for people of all walks of life and spiritual backgrounds. Helping us to see God in new ways and redefine his plan for our lives. Are you ready to think differently about discipleship? Grief Share helped me realize that I wasn't going crazy, that it really helped me to focus on the Lord during those dark times. The folks in that Grief Share group were the only ones who knew what I was going through and how I was feeling. It still hurts, but I'm not suffocating anymore. Grief Share is a small group open to men and women who are dealing with the death of a loved one, friend, or relative. To find a group, visit www.griefshare.org. What do you do when you don't know what to do? When there's no way forward and no good way out of your situation? There are bad ways out. You can run, give up, give in, quit. It seems to be getting darker with every passing day. It's like you've entered a tunnel and lost your bearings. You don't know where to turn or how to get out. You don't know how to get through. When will it end? What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? You work 
too hard to get to the end of your life and have nothing to show for it. This is my family's legacy that I'm talking about here. I've got to have a plan and be focused. That knowledge that you pass down to your kids, that is how you change a family tree. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you have that moment where you say, I've had it. I'm not going to live like this anymore. I didn't know what was going on with mom and dad, but I could tell they were mad at each other. Something bad happened. They didn't talk very much. We didn't have fun like we used to. Sometimes I wondered if it was my fault. I was scared they were going to get a divorce. But then stuff changed. Mom and Dad were both gone once a week. They said they had a church group they were going to. I didn't really care at the beginning, but I remember they started to talk again. We started doing more together as a family. Things were changing. Now, Mom and Dad show love to each other all the time. Even though seeing them kissing is gross, it helps me feel better to know stuff is different, and now I'm not scared anymore. I feel like I have my Mom and Dad back. Our family is happy. Hello, Damascus Road. Is anyone excited to be together? Yes, it is so good to be together. Hey, a big welcome, no matter where you're watching from across our four viewing venues. If you're online, welcome. Go ahead and let us know where you're watching from. Our chat host would love to say hi. Welcome to all of you in the auditorium. A shout out to those watching outside in our outdoor venue on the 16 foot screen in your lawn chairs. Hello, we see you. And welcome to those in our overflow venue in the gym. And we are so glad to be together. Hey, listen, you'll hear later in the message that at DRCC, we often say everyone always has a next right step in their faith journey. And we at Damascus Road want to come alongside you and help you in that growth journey. So we want to hear from you. Go ahead and get out your phone. It is okay. Get out your smartphone. Go ahead and hover your camera over the QR code or you can go to the DRCC app on the homepage and connect, uh, click on connect with us. This is your opportunity to communicate with us so that we know how best to come alongside and support you. There's literally only three fields to fill out. Go ahead and hover your camera on that QR code. It's very simple. And then you can go ahead and check the box in which you'd like more information. You can check small groups or serving. Maybe it's baptism, or maybe you just wanna to talk to someone about following Jesus. Go ahead and fill out that Connect card today. And if you're newer to Damascus Road, we are so glad you decided to join us. You know, whether it's your first time joining us or maybe your third, we would love for you to go ahead and fill out that Connect card. Tell us that you're here. We have a digital gift that we would love to get into your hands. And if you're here on campus, go ahead and swing by Guest Central in the lobby. We have a team waiting for you and a gift bag to get into your hands. All right. So you'll wanna stick around after the service. We have some big news about some changes to our worship service next weekend. So stick around, you won't wanna miss that. But at this time, let's stand up, take a deep breath, let go of the cares and worries of this world, let go of the stress, take a deep breath, and let's sing together to worship our King. Let's go. Thanks, Jason. You guys ready to worship this morning? When all I see is a battle 
You see my victory. I know you do, God. <laughs> when all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain moved. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Yes, it does. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Come on, sing this out. So when I fight, I fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, and I sing through the night. There's nothing impossible for you. Sing it. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Come on. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power. for your strength my story isn't over my story's just begun and failure won't define me that's what my father does come on my failure won't define me that's what my father does Ooh, lay 
moments and our weaknesses and our failures, but who runs to us in those low times. And we serve a God who has given us so much. Paul tells us in Romans 8, he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God did not withhold his son, but if he gave him up for us, will he not so much more freely give us all things along with him? And God invites us into his life to be a giver like him. And so today, right now, is your opportunity to do that through text, through the app, through our website, by mailing a check to give back to God's work. If you are a visitor with us, you don't need to give to our church. We just want you to be our guest. But if you're family, now is your time to give back to the work God is doing here and through his church and in his world. We're going to take a moment to pray a blessing over these gifts and also a blessing over our children and families who are returning to school this week. So I invite you to raise your hand with me as we pray for God's blessing. Lord, we are just so thankful that your mercies are new every morning, that your faithfulness is great, your grace is super abundant and never ending. And we ask that you will take these gifts that are just a small amount of what you've given us and return them to you and use them, multiply them to tell others and to spread your word of love in this world. 
And Lord, we pray for your blessing over our children as they return to school after a year and a half full of so much disruption and isolation. Lord, we pray for continuity. We pray for safety. We pray for new friendships, the renewal of old friendships. We pray that you'll give us grace as we navigate these uh, new and challenging procedures. We pray that our kids will just learn well, and we pray just so much for your, for your blessing on our teachers, on our families, as they just try and work together and find a new normal. We know that you love us, and you promise to be with us in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue to draw close. Spirit sound, rushing wind, fire of God fall within. Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, turn from sin, revival.
Would you pour your spirit out to us this morning? God, would you give us a fresh wind, a fresh heart, a fresh spirit, God? The spirit of, of you and who you are. God, we're honored to stand here and worship you this morning. Be with us. It's in your name we pray, amen. So are you ready? Yeah. That, that bumper that we just watched, that little setup to our messages in this series is so perfect and you're going to see it one more week. So if you're here virtually or live or on the lawn, please think through the message of that even before the message begins. So how are you? I, it is so exciting to walk out to a room full of real people. I cannot tell you. I was saying to Debbie, we we did this revelation class all winter. And for 13 weeks, I walked out here and taught my heart out to a totally empty room. And if that wasn't the weirdest experience in my life. So I want to say a couple things before we start sort of Regendra style here for a minute. Um, but, But really... You know, I'm getting old. I've said that a lot. Um, But you start reflecting back, you know. And today was so special to me because if you noticed, Candy Varmer was on the piano. And Candy has been with us, with me as a pastor, using her voice and her gifts for 30 years. Yeah. And, And still just so energetic, such a, she pours into the young people, and then I was looking at her, and then I looked across the stage, and, and there was, along with Candy, there was Haley Knight, and you, may, you didn't know this, but today is Haley's 24th birthday, so let's give a, and she, and you know, she, she reminds me of Candy a long time ago, and I used to think, you know, when Candy started singing for the Lord at this church, Haley was six years away from being born. (laughs) And there they are together, just blending together. So I I also want to say one other personal thing real quick before we dive in. You know, this weekend is a bit uh, crazy at our house. We have my daughter, Tasha, and her two sons, my grandsons, which some of you know I waited a long time for and kept praying for. I used to say to my children who are really into education, Quit getting degrees and make some babies, okay? (laughs) You know, so Tasha's here with her two sons. Matt and Jolene are here with our granddaughter, Anna. Luke and Tiffany are out there with us. Um, But I want to give a real uh, moment here to the other guest in our room. He didn't know I was going to do this. But, you know, you often kid around and say there's people you want to be when you grow up, even when you're older. Well, the man I'm about to introduce to you is the guy I want to be when I grow up. Uh, Sally's uncle, Bob, is here. He recently celebrated his 94th birthday. He's in the room with us. And 
You know, getting to 94 is impressive, but last year he lost his wife, Betsy, after 71 years of marriage. And the, that's impressive, but what has really touched me deeply, it just makes me want to weep every time I really give it much thought, is that Bob Simpson... Uh, walked his, his love affair with his wife for 71 years, but in the last six or seven years or so, Betsy did a slow walk into Alzheimer's. And Bob determined that she was going to stay at home. And so a man in his late, six, uh, late, nine, excuse me, late 80s and early 90s became the primary caregiver for his wife, Betsy, all the way uh, to some pretty severe Alzheimer's, and she died at home in her own bed because of Bob's care for her. And I just always think, that's a promise kept. That's worthy of double honor. So Bob, we just honor you today. He's right over here. Uh, and by the way, at 94, he cruised up by himself from uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and said the traffic wasn't bad. So, <laughs> okay, here we go. So, as I already said, good morning to everybody in the auditorium, to the overflow, out on the lawn, and all our virtual. Last week, uh, I, I can't get into my message today without mentioning last week's message, Regendra. I think we all have our favorite Regendra messages and Regendra stories, but as I listened to Regendra's mas message last week on being a world changer instead of a wind chaser, not through trying to puff yourself up or be big or be seen or be, you know, but by putting the towel of service over your arm and serving in unselfish love, that is the true way to be a world changer. And I listened to that message and I thought, you know, however um, smooth or slick, and they always are, however good his stories, that message is the most important message for this church going forward. I cannot emphasize that enough. There is nothing that sucks the cynicism out of seekers more than unselfish service. And going forward, we can, we can discuss or dialogue or even argue about all sorts of things. Our country is getting better and better at the latter. But really what's going to change lives is when we, in response to God's great love for us, start to overflow an unselfish service, there is no gainsaying the power of that, and it makes people wonder, what makes these people tick? How can they be so different? And we've always believed here, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute, we've always believed that um, I am not the minister, or Regendra is not the minister of, of Damascus Road. We are pastors by calling, but every single person sitting here today who has given their life to Jesus Christ, is equally a minister of Christ. Every one of us has gifts that the Spirit's been put within us to use, and we are to find how to use those gifts in service for him. And that's, and when we do that in the context of community, when we really do that together in community, that's how we grow to be the people God wants us to be. So if you missed that message last week, I strongly encourage you to go back and get it. Listen to it. Okay, the theme for today, I'm going to try to drill this home. It's very complex, uh, so please follow this. The theme for today is... Follow me. Got it? Would you say it with me? Follow me. Now notice, that's in quotes, and notice the me here is not me. It's not Regendra. The me that's in the quote is the risen Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. The call that we're going to talk about today, that we're going to dig down into and flesh out together, is the simple, most important, most profound call that there can be in your life. And it is the call of Jesus looking into the eyes of each one of us, whether we're 24 or 94. Jesus looks at us and he says, follow me. Follow me. Those two words change everything in a life. And I love to say this whenever I get up and start teaching. If what I'm about to say to you 
you know, if, if Jesus isn't who he said he is, if he didn't do what he said he did and then did, if he didn't really rise bodily, physically from the grave after dying on a cross for our sins, well, and of course, everything I'm about to say doesn't really matter, but if he did, then nothing else matters so much as what we're doing here together right now. So let's pray together. Lord, I pray for your spirit in this room. I pray for you to get your work done in each of our lives at whatever stage of life we're at, that you would pour your spirit into us and that we might hear you speak to us individually and as a community on mission together. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so these words are not the words, they're not sort of the appeal or plea or invitation of a long dead teacher like a Plato or a Pythagoras. They are the present command, we believe, of the risen and living Lord of history. When we go down to the bedrock, the essence of genuine Christianity, I think you find the essence in these two words, follow me. Follow me. I, would you just one more time indulge me? Would you say it out loud strongly with me? Let's say it. Follow me. That is the theme, that's the goal, and that's actually the application of today's message. So I think you know where we're going. Now, I love the story of Vince Lombardi, the legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers, Tasha. She now lives in Wisconsin. She's cheesehead now. Of the Green Bay Packers, for whom the, the uh, NFL... Super Bowl championship trophy is to this day named for. And you know, every year at the start of the season, every single year, Coach Lombardi would gather his very often championship teams into the locker room for their first meeting at the start of a new season. And he always did the same thing. He would show up in the locker room with this old gym bag. He would unzip the gym bag and he would pull out a brand new football. And he would hold it up in front of these seasoned players and he would look them in the eye with such great sincerity and he would say, gentlemen, this is a football. This is why we exist together as a team. This is why we are here together today. Our singular purpose, everything we do together is to get this football across the goal line of our opponents or keep our opponents from getting this football across our goal line. And then he would look at them and he would say, never forget that. Ladies and gentlemen, Christianity is Jesus Christ. It is not primarily a great idea. It is not a deep philosophy. It is not centered in a system of correct behavior by which we're somehow hoping to gain the approval of God. The beating heart and defining center of Christianity is this out outrageous, scandalous belief and conviction that we are banking our whole hope in life, that we are offering to the world a message that is founded in the fact, get this, think about this, that the creator God himself entered into his own creation and he did not come here to overwhelm us or to destroy his rebellious and all too often self-absorbed creatures, but he came as a man, as a child, as a boy, as a man, to bear our guilt, to die the death that we had earned in order to give us as an unearned gift the eternal life which alone was rightfully his. How outrageous is this? But he is more, friends, and this is where we get to our topic. He is more than the crucified Savior. He is the victorious over death, returning, excuse me, risen and returning Lord of all creation. He claimed, starting 800 years before he came through the mouth of Isaiah, he claimed he would establish a kingdom, and no matter what went up or down in any nation or in any time, that that kingdom would never end. It would roll right into eternity. 
So here's the deal, friends. We can discuss issues related to Christianity and the church. I, I love those kind of discussions, both the up, the high points, and the really dark and bad points. The, the history of the church is like the history of every one of us in the rooms, kind of checkered. There's good points and very bad, bad points. But we, we, that is the people of God, we are never, ever the source of God's salvation. We ourselves and no one else, we are not the perfect image of God's character, nor are we the life-giving source of his spirit. You know what we are? We are simply the beggars who have chosen to receive the bread of life who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in receiving him into our life, we have received his spirit, and that spirit works in us to create lives, increasing lives step by step of love and of joy and of peace and patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. And now, in response to so great a salvation, in response to such unearned love, we are called as the people of God, man, this is our identity, friends, we are called to share and to model through un self lives of unselfish serving and giving what who he is the world jesus said it himself in his last prayer on his last night in john 17 he said the world is going to believe father that you sent me the world is going to believe that i am who i said i am when they see your people living in this unity of mission and serving together that's when the world will believe all that he has done for us. Now, listen, this is so important. A Christian is anyone, 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 with any background, all of us equally valued. Please hear this in the political climate we live in now. Anyone from any tribe, any nation, any tongue, and any people, all equally valued, all infinitely valued, Anyone who has received Jesus as Lord in their life. We are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, I was looking at that this morning when I was getting ready while the house was in a hubbub. I was in a corner and I was, I was reading again like Romans 6. You know, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It says it over and over again. The one we follow is not simply a savior. He is our Lord. Friends, this is so important. When Jesus, love that sound. That's the future of the church walking out right there. Bless you, Lara. Um, But listen, this, this really is uh, such an important point, so I'm praying and talking out loud while I do it that the thought will come back to me, but here we go. A um, little distraction. No, so Lord is not really a, a tough co- concept, though. It's not one we use, uh, thankfully, in our culture today. You know, no one's the Lord today except the Lord. And the idea of Lord is very simple. I want you to really wrestle with this for me a minute. Lord doesn't mean that instantly you're perfect and do everything Jesus asks you to do perfectly. What Lord means, and I've said this to you a hundred times, but it's so important. What Lord means is that every single day we wake up and each in our own way, I do it by putting a little cross around my neck and reciting a vision of life to myself, but however we do it, every day we, we wake up and we have a very fundamental decision to make. And that decision is, am I Lord of my life and am I living today through my own autonomous self-focus, you know, the, my little universe revolving around me at the center? Am I gonna choose to live that way today or is Jesus really the Lord and I'm going to step off the throne of my life today and I'm going to offer all my brokenness and craziness, all the thoughts I wouldn't want anybody to know. I'm offering it all to him and I'm saying, Lord, you are free to work in my life today and to the best of my ability, when my will and your will collide, your will's going to be on top. I want to learn 
what it means to follow you more and more. And man, as you all know, that is the work of a lifetime. That's a work that never ends. There's no arriving in that. I think that God intentionally sort of works in our lives to just peel back layer after layer of our selfishness and our self-absorbed fears and our, you know, our, our ego needs. He just keeps working on it because he's teaching us what it means to really, truly understand that there is that there's a God and it's not us, that, that God has a purpose for us, that purpose is not primarily hyper-religious, it's very practical and real. It has to do with the two greatest commandments of learning to love God and love neighbors as we love ourselves. And he's leading us into that and he wants to do that if we will let him. We don't make Jesus Lord. He is the Lord. But we decide whether we're going to rebel against that and keep ourselves on the throne or put him on the throne. Listen, please. Well, you know, I, another verse I looked at this morning, I love it, says, um, there is no difference whether you're Jew or Gentile for all who confess with their mouth Jesus is Lord and truly believe that he died for our sins and rose again will be saved. It says, for all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved all who, man that is a great sentence that is a beautiful sentence we are saved by the lord jesus christ to embrace jesus is to acknowledge jesus as my lord and all who do have salvation in jesus christ as a present gift he is the lord and here's the deal there's no way to say to jesus I, you know what i I'm really convicted, Jesus. I'm going to give you 60% of my life. You're the Lord there. I'm keeping 40. Can't do it. Can't even do 90-10. He is either Lord of everything or he's not really Lord of anything. He is Lord of all or he's not really Lord at all. But he understands that it takes us a long time to understand and his claim on our life is defined by these two simple words that we're talking about today. Follow me. Seeing our whole life as a journey, a journey of learning more and more what it means to increasingly trust and follow the risen Lord in every part of our lives. You see, in the world of Jesus, both the, the Hebrew world and the Greek world, a disciple... A disciple, the Greek word is methetes. A methetes was not simply someone who believed in the words of their teacher, their didaskalos. A methetes didn't just believe in their didaskalos, but, they, but their didaskalos, their teacher, their rabbi, was someone who they followed who they wanted to live their life in proximity with, who not only in their words and understanding of life, but in their way of life and their choices, the Methetes wanted to emulate them. And Jesus took this whole tradition, this already existing tradition, and he deepened it through the, his outrageous, I love to say it, all-encompassing claims. Just look at with me for a minute. It's gonna be on the screen somewhere down here if you're uh, watching virtually, but look at it with me, it, how he defined discipleship. In Luke 9, verse 23, Jesus said, it says, then Jesus said to who? Now, I, I think it's really important. He didn't say, hey, if you want to be a super disciple, if you want to be one of the elite, here's the, here's the deal. He said to all of them, catch the next word, whoever, whoever, Anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. I've heard a lot of crap about that, that phrase. You know, I really have. But, but it's really a simple phrase. It doesn't mean deny your identity. It doesn't mean deny your personality. It doesn't mean deny yourself any pleasures. What it means is you deny that you're the Lord of your life. That's what it means. You're, you're denying that you're the little God at the center of your life. You deny yourself. You take up a cross. Again, that doesn't mean wearing a shiny gold little thing around your neck, what it means. And it doesn't mean you put up with a, a troublesome mother-in-law either. You know, She's not your cross. I hate to tell you guys, but that's not it. No, the, the, 
the cross, taking up the cross is actually saying every day I am going to crucify my self-absorbed bent to be my own little God. That's what it means. So every day you're, Jesus says they will take up their cross and catch it and follow me. To Jesus, there's a very real way in which people living today in this world, in this culture, can still follow him. Look at the next one. This is a powerful one. John 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to who? All the people. The people in the toughest situations, the people that don't know where the next page, he spoke to everybody. And he says, I am the light of the world. I love this. I love this next line. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Man, what a cool promise. Whoever walks, follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Matthew 4, the calling of the first two disciples, it says, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting nets in the lake because that's what they did. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, he didn't just say, hey, believe in me and, you know, have fun. I, I will tell you honestly, he did not say, just believe in me, hang on, and someday I'll get you out of here. He didn't say that. He said, come, follow me. And I love this next line. I, you know, I will make you fishers of humanity. It says at once, they left their nets and they followed him. For them, at that moment, it was a literal, physical, leaving something behind and going forward. Sometimes that will be true in us. We need to leave something behind to go forward. In John 1, verse 43, Jesus finds a guy named Nathaniel who's going to be so significant in his work going forward. And Jesus just walks up to this guy, doesn't really, I mean, Nathaniel obviously heard about Jesus, but Jesus just cuts to the mustard. He just walks up and says to him, follow me. I want to do one more example of this. So my, it's, this is a personal life one for me. When um, I got um, diagnosed with leukemia, and, you know, did the whole deal with them, and they told me, yeah, it's a blood cancer, and, you know, there's no cure, you know, that we know of right now. So that's a, that's a heavy thing to hear. And I remember reading this story again, and it just so spoke to my heart. This, and this snapshot is in John 21, and I'd love to spend the next 20 minutes here, but I'm going to try to do it quickly. Peter who is now at this point in the story the deeply repentant three-time denier of Jesus. He is now walking along the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee and at his side is the crucified but now risen Christ walking beside him. Man, has Peter had a morning. First, they, they work all night, catch nothing, and then Jesus gives them this miraculous catch of fish and then they get to shore with the fish, and Jesus has prepared breakfast. And I think this is one of the coolest parts of this story. Jesus has prepared the breakfast, and it says specifically in John 21 that he prepared it over a charcoal fire. Now, you know, why is that important to put in there? Well, it's important because when Jesus, when Peter denied Jesus outside the home of Caiaphas, when he tried to follow Jesus at a distance. That's not, never a good idea. But he was, he was outside Caiaphas' home. He denied Jesus' time. It says very specifically, he did it around a charcoal fire. He's standing around a charcoal fire, and three times he denies Jesus. Now the risen Christ prepares him a breakfast on a charcoal fire, and while they're sitting at that charcoal fire, I love this, three times Jesus gives him the opportunity to walk back his denial and reaffirm his faith. Is that not beautiful? That's Jesus. You know, sometimes we, 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 he tries to teach us a lesson. We're too proud, stupid, or arrogant to learn it. So he's got to bring us back to the same point. But when we finally get it, he's going to deepen it in us and make sure it's a part of our life. And he does this right here with Peter. Uh, and then he says to Peter, now, here's the deal, Peter. When you were younger... You got to decide where you wanted to go and what you wanted to do, and you know what that was like, but now you're following me. 
And I'm just going to tell you something he doesn't tell most of us most time. He said, Peter, here's the deal. Someday you're going to stretch forth your hands. They're going to be tied, and you're going to be led somewhere you don't want to go. He, he literally tells Peter, you're going to be a martyr. And then the very next words in the story, he tells him that, and he says, now, follow me. And they get up and they start on a walk, literally, physically, a walk down the beach. And Peter's trying to absorb all this and take it all in. And as they're walking, he looks back and he sees John doing what you're supposed to do. He's following Jesus and Peter. And, and Peter looks back and he sees John and he, he asks this question. He goes, so Jesus, what about him? What's his life going to be like? What does he get, or what is he going to do? Is he going to die young, or is he going to live old? You know, what? I mean, and it, it, this is so much a Christian thing we want to do sometimes. We, we want to say to Jesus, yeah, okay, this is where you got me, but why, they, why do they have this, or what, what, how come they got that? Or, and so Peter looks back, and he goes, what about him? And I, I need to, this is such an important statement. I've shared this with you many times, but I love this. You need to remember this word. The word is witty. Witty. Because what Jesus says to Peter at that moment is he says, what is that to you? What is that to you? You follow me. The only task Jesus gives us is not to figure out what's going on with everybody else, not to judge or evaluate our life in light of their lives. The only thing Jesus says is, don't worry about them, I've got them. You follow me. What is that to you? You must follow me. You know, I can multiply these statements of Jesus over and over. I mean, again, one that I thought about going into, but no time. Is, is the story of the rich young ruler. You know, the rich young ruler really to me is, is a cool guy in this sense. He was hyper religious, but he was sincerely hyper religious. He wasn't hypocritical hyper religious. He wasn't one of those people that, you know, you tell them that your dog died and they say, Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, and you want to go, <sighs> No, he wasn't that kind of religious. He was, he was really a man that was genuinely trying to figure out how to do God's will to the best of his ability. And it's so neat. Jesus hears that and he honors that and he says, there's just one thing left. All those things you're doing are so cool and I honor them. There's one thing left. Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. Because that is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. Now, I, again, we could keep going, but I want you to see the verse that really sort of bedrocked this whole message for me and bedrocks our adult discipleship pathway plan is, is found uh, it's, it's in Colossians. And Paul, who was a follower of Jesus par excellence, really total all-in guy, He's writing to this new church of Gentiles in Colossia, and he's explaining to them who Jesus is. And the whole first chapter of the book of Colossians is this glorious pantheon of praise to Jesus as the creator and redeemer, the one who gives us hope, the fullness of God embodied. He just does this beautiful thing, and then he comes to these verses. Look at them in Colossians 2, 6 and 7. He says, therefore, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, catch it, so walk in in him having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him that's what the that video at the beginning was talking to us about and established in your faith so that you can overflow with gratitude let me just do one more text and then we're going to do our application in one of the final pictures of God's church in the whole book, in the whole Bible, in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, way back in chapter 14, it describes one more time the people of God gathered around the, the Lamb, the risen Christ, and it defines them by one primary characteristic. Look at it with me. Revelation 14, 4 says, these are those who what? They follow the Lamb Where? It doesn't matter. Up, down, sideways, they are determined that they're going to follow Jesus wherever he leads them. So what does that mean? 
for you and me on Tuesday morning or Wednesday afternoon? What does that mean when we go to work or in our marriage or in our circle of friends when we get together on a weekend? What does it mean truly daily to determine to follow Jesus? I think this is so important because what I love about Jesus, when you read Actually, read the Jesus of the Gospels. He's so practical. He's so tangible. He's so down to earth. Jesus is a guy that actually asked more penetrating questions than he gave quick religious answers. Jesus is really cool. And when he says, follow me, he's not being hyper-mystical. So what does it mean? Let's just stay literal in our thinking for a minute. Track with me. If you are truly following someone and that person is going somewhere new, somewhere you are not currently, then you are by definition what? You're moving. You can't stand still if you're following someone who's going somewhere. You are not standing still. You cannot stay in the same place. You cannot be a person who year after year after year just keeps doing the same thing Over and over again, I remember another person in this room that's been with us for the whole run, Debbie Lawrence, she used to say to me, the definition of insanity is to just keep doing the same thing over and over and over and think you're going to get a different result. That's insanity. And so Jesus wants step by step to lead us somewhere to a better place. We cannot just stay the same if we're a Christian. If The one we are following has a destination for us in mind as part of a larger community, and it's somewhere different than we are right now. That means our life as a Christian is a journey. And here's the point. And if we are being led by a great leader on the right journey, there is always, there is always, there is always a next right step in our life. Man, I want to embed that in in your psyche. If you are a Christian, one of the things you pay attention to constantly, I'm at an interesting season in my life, and I pray about this a lot. What is the next right step in this season of life? A guided journey towards a definite, definite, definite destination is always a long series of singular next right steps. It is a long obedience in the same direction. It is a trajectory that involves incremental change. Now, I want to digress for a minute so I can build on that phrase, next right step with you, but I'll I'll try to do this quickly. I want to drive that point home. Here's the truth. In my journey of being a pastor, I've This January will be 48 years for me as a pastor, and in my journey of being a pastor, when I, well, thank you, that was nice, but here's the point, though. (laughs) You grow, thank God. So at the beginning, I thought being a pastor, and especially in the role of being a teaching pastor, I thought the most important thing I could do in the pulpit every week was to bring new and fresh and innovative ideas that wowed the congregation. So everybody was there like, wow, I never thought of that, man. That is so cool. That, he, he is really cool, you know. <laughs> and thank God, God started convicting me because what I started to realize is people can come out and say, wow, Pastor, that was one of the best messages I ever heard. And you can talk to them on Wednesday and they don't even remember 10% of it. What I started to realize is that at best, at best, a week after you preach your heart out on a well-crafted message, people might remember 10% of what you said. Maybe. Hopefully. And so it changed everything for me because I started to realize that the most important thing that I can do is actually to keep repeating key principles of the Christian walk, key ideas, key steps over and over and over again. I, re- I realized that sustained movement in a spirit-led God direction life versus our all-too-natural uh, me-centered drift, it required embedding the key perspectives Jesus gave us for our life together and a journey with him. It required 
deeply embedding a shared common language, key phrases that we talked about again and again and then again and then again until they became phrases that the whole congregation could actually finish the phrase or at least smile at with a sense of knowing together. And so we came up with some key phrases. The first one, the big one, the one we still define ourselves by, let's see if you can finish it with me. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And we believe, according to Scripture, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, for I delivered unto you as of first importance that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was actually buried physically and he rose physically on the third day according to Scriptures. And he says, if you hang on to that, you will be saved. The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing now, in, in, in all fairness, I need to say this, that doesn't mean that we dodge talking about tough issues by saying, well, that's not our business. We, we're supposed to talk about the cross. No, 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 no. You know, actually, to our shame, there were 80 years in American history where every year about 78 black people were lynched without a trial, just taken out of their homes and hung. And do you know during those 78 years, black pastors appealed to white pastors for help to stop this insanity? And do you know what the white pastors said? They said, we can't get involved with that. We're called to preach the gospel. No, no, that is not what we're saying here. What we're saying is that we will tackle every issue the Lord Jesus calls us to, but we will do it in the light of, of the mercy, justice, and holiness of God revealed at the cross. We will do it in the light of what the cross teaches us, both about our great need that should humble us and our great value because he would go to the cross to save us. And we're always going to talk about everything through the grid of the power of that cross, right? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. But here's another phrase Hope you can sort of recognize this one. In Jesus Christ, friends, as Christians, we are not working towards victory. We are working what? From victory. Thank you. I love this. Look at, look at 1 John 5 with me. I, I don't know anywhere it's said any clearer. It says, the part of the verse that's not up there, it says, God has given us a testimony about his son. He says, this is verse 10, that's not there. God has given us a testimony about his son. Uh, and he says, he who doesn't believe the testimony makes God out to be a liar. And now we have these words. And this is the testimony. This is the testimony of God. If you deny this, you, you're making God a liar. That God, not might, someday, hopefully, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Man, friends, please hear me. The, the great issue at the end of your life is not going to be whether you are good enough because you're not. And neither is the guy talking. The great issue at the end of your life isn't even going to be the sin question. It's going to be the son question. What have you done with Jesus Christ? He who, he has given us this life. This life is in his son. He who has the son has eternal life. This is where we're supposed to live. If we're giving ourselves to Jesus Christ every day, eternal life begins right now. He who does not have the Son of God, whatever, however religious, however, you know, whatever they are, they don't have life. The thing, this, he says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, I love this so much, so that you may know, that you may know that you possess right now that you have eternal life. The Christian is someone who lives in response to salvation, not in a sweating, striving towards it. Let me give you a few others that I've done over the years. I hope you can finish them. In Christ, we always know that the best is yet to come. Thank you. That is so true. By the grace of God, we want to be a community of people where when someone is struggling, they run to us, not from us, thank you. The path to intimacy is through conflict handled well. 
We are called to love all people freely and unselfishly, but friends, we are called to live for an audience of one. That's a big one worth a a message. We are called to live for an audience of one and love everyone unselfishly. We are saved individually, but friends, this is so important. We are saved into community. There is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. The church is not a building or a program that we go to once in a while. The church is us. True Christianity is never a spectator sport. Now I'm gonna tell you one that I've used on you for 30 years in every message, and you didn't even know it. (laughs) But in every message, at least five or six times, I've used one key word, because here's the truth about Uh, Christians in North America, especially Christian men, I'm going to talk as a man to men for a minute. Christians in North America are more shaped by John Wayne than Jesus Christ. Some of you are young saying, who the heck is John Wayne? (laughs) But, you know, pick pick your current. You're more, and here's, here's the deal. We in America are so, and pardon me, I'm I'm being, I'm using this word theologically, we are so damned proud of our individualism. But here's the truth. If you are a Christian, you are called into community. So for years, I've used one word in every message, and that word is together, 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 together. We have to be a community on mission what? together. Thank you so much. So all these phrases um, are, are really important, but one that is right a part of our core values is this one. We believe that every single member is equally a minister of Jesus Christ. We believe that we are saved to serve, and that serving makes us, as Regenera said so beautifully last week, world changers instead of wind chasers. Now these phrases, ideas, and thinking, I've pounded away for 30 years in this place, but along with those, there is one more phrase that I want you to get, it's so important, and that is that we always, on our journey together in a Christ-centered mission towards a Christ-centered life, we all of us always have Our next right, always. But the real Christian journey is seldom, if ever, a physical journey. It doesn't involve constant geographical shifting, at least very rarely. It is instead this inner journey of deepening trust, humility, and gratitude. It is a deepening journey of maturing character, because here's the deal about God. You may not like this, but it's true. God isn't worried about your comfort. He's worried about your character. That's the truth. He's not worried about everything being easy for you. He's worried about turning you into an effective lover of people. He's going to lead you in ways that are going to grow you, and growth never happens through drift or lethargy. It always takes energy. So, you know, it, it, this journey is an inner journey of, of this deepening trust and humility and gratitude. It is a journey of ever-deepening maturity in, oh man, lo- <laughs> I'm getting old, <laughs> in loving unselfishly, that will lead us right into eternity, always learning better and better how to receive from God and then share in practical and tangible ways and through our choices and attitudes a life of growing, thoughtful, and unselfish love. Now, in that journey, what I'm saying to you, in this journey of following Jesus, there will always, always be a next right step. And what we've done is we've, we've realized that there are some major steps that are always true for all of us in that journey. So look at this next slide with me. It's going to be right there. There we go. Thank you. And if you look across, if you look at the top, this is our adult pathway, and it just talks about taking the next right step together because we all have one, both individually and together. 
And it's a journey from just exploring who Jesus is to the adventure of an overflowing Christ-centered life. And when you look down the column, it gives you really four things and then a fifth at the bottom. But those first four things are all choices that we have to make as Christians. Friends, we're, we're getting down to it now. Done preaching, I'm starting meddling. Because we're, the, these four things you have to have in your life if you want to be a growing Christian. You have to be a person who gets into Scripture and lets God's Word speak to you as you read it prayerfully. That's, that's so important. Number two, you can't do, you know, the, the, the Christian journey is not about amassing a bigger pile of perishable goods so that you can arrive at death comfortably. It is about serving and giving. We are to be rivers, not reservoirs of what God gives to us. We're to grow in that capacity. We, we're, we're, supposed to, we're not supposed to live in isolation. We're supposed to do life together 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 and then we're we're to share Jesus but that doesn't mean strained uneasy it just means you know um just being honest about your struggles but saying in that honesty I've found help and the help's made all the difference right and just people don't want a perfect Christian they just want a genuine one now, the last thing, though, is really, after all my time's up, this is really why they assigned me this message. So, the last thing is, in everybody's life in this room, there are points where you hit barriers that stop your growth. You want to grow, and suddenly you're hitting a barrier. And those barriers are pretty predictable, we found out. They're barriers of relational hurts. They're barriers of undisciplined points in our life. They're barriers of strongholds or addictions. They're the kind of barriers that you get into them and they just stop growth. You know, one of the things I remember my dear friend Mike Albro saying to me years ago who worked in, with the addiction community, he says when someone starts using drugs, they emotionally arrest right at that point and never develop another day till they get clean emotionally. So that's true to a degree for all of us in different areas of our life. So we, the, the goal of the adult pathway in this church, the goal is to help remove barriers so that we can keep taking our next right step. Do you get it? The goal of the adult pathway is that we don't want to be the same person right now in five years that we are right now, we actually want to grow. And we need to get barriers out of the way. And the job of the church is to anticipate the most predictable barriers we're going to run into and help remove them. We call that our adult pathway. So look with me at the pathway offerings this year. Here we go. We're going to do this very quickly. If you, and according to the stats, I'm talking to a lot of people right now, men and women, if you have a struggle with pornography, we have... A, a, a experience for you called pure desire that is very um, it, it guards the anonymity of those in it and it works through to help them reach a new point in their life and break this addiction we also have grief share grief share uh, has become one of the most powerful classes in this church when people lose a loved one, there is a process that's healthy that they need to go through but they can't do it alone most of the time in fact, I doubt ever. And Grief Share helps with that. So that's a class. We have our membership class. If you're kind of on the edge of this church and you're thinking through whether this is the right place for you, that's your next right step. We have First Step. If you're not even sure you want to join this church but you want to know more about it, that's your next step. We have Divorce Care, which is run by a very dear friend of mine, Gary, and it helps people walk through the trauma of going through the breach of a significant of the break of their marriage. We have you saw this if you're in here early Financial Peace University. Do you know the number one cause of fighting and the number one cause of divorce according to marriage counselors is over matter of financial tension and money. And that really if you're too much in debt you can't even think clearly 
And Financial Peace University is just a way to get that under control and have a plan financially for your life. So that, then we have, let's go to that next one. This one is a new class. It's a Rick Warren class, and it's just, if you have just been whacked and you feel like you're on your back, there is a class that's going to be led here that's called How to Get Through What You're Going Through, How to Take the Next Right Step. Let's go to the next one. Is that not the coolest title in the world? You know, every single marriage needs help. And this class is so real and so practical. Marriage, what did you expect, right? Check that one out if you're, if you're married. We have Sister to Sister, and they're going to be doing a new series. This is our women's ministry together. Let's keep going. And then this class, I, I love the, the point of this one. If you're trying to figure out what are my gifts and what, what has God best equipped me to do, then you want to check out Place. It's a three-week course that just helps you figure out who am I, how did God design me, what environment do I work in best, and how can I fit into where God wants me to. Because as Regenera said, we're not interested in plugging people in holes. We're interested in helping people find their place in the body of Christ. Okay. And this, this class is for the, everybody in this room has somebody they care about and love who's not a Christian and may be asking questions. Alpha is for people who are not yet Christians but want to explore the idea of God in their life. Now this next one I'm going to invite a good friend out for. His name is Phil Briggs. He was, it, it, the first time we went through the Rooted class, which he's going to tell you a little bit about, this is for new believers or any believers that want to deepen their understanding of their faith. He, this man was my poster child. <laughs> and he made it so much fun. So Phil, just talk a little bit about Rooted. Thank you so much, Richard. Yeah, um, I stumbled upon the church literally kind of stumbling. Um, my brother had just died. My wife had lost her job. We'd driven by this church a hundred times over the last few years, and I'd never even thought about going. And life just got so rough and wrecked. I was like, I need, I need something more in my life. And I grew up in the church, and I understood the church, and my parents took me to church. And I was friends with the preacher's kid, if that tells you what I thought of the church. <laughs> we... We lived up to the reputation of wild kids that uh, grew up in the church, but uh, I didn't really get it. I mean, I knew of the Bible. I could quote some of it. I'd heard the stories. I knew Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the other guys, but I didn't get it. I'd never read the book, and I always thought it was, like, too hard to read, so it took me till this horrible year to realize that I should probably come to church. And when I found this church, I found this class rooted, and it just made it so simple. It's like it switched something on. It finally turned on the on switch. I started reading the Bible and the class was so easy to take because Richard made it so simple to learn and you could ask any question. In fact, week one, do you remember my question? I was like, are Adam and Eve like real people or is that just like a story? I, I, I didn't even know what I didn't know. So I could ask the dumbest questions, the silliest questions. And by week three or four, I'm like having conversations about the Bible outside of Sunday, which was huge for me. Ian, you know what I'm talking about, right? We're talking like on Friday nights, uh, you know, while you're driving home from work. And I'm like, oh, it's Friday night. This used to be the time for happy hour and bars. And I'm talking about the Bible now. Um, the, the, whole, the whole course was just amazing. It switched the on switch on. And now I listen to the Bible and I committed after Rooted to read the whole thing. So I started Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I'm up to Corinthians. But I just thought I'd end by saying, not only does this class turn the light switch on, but just last night I'm driving home from vacation at the beach. It's like dark, thunderstorms raging, lightning flashing all around, and I got the earbud in, and I'm listening to Corinthians. And the light show kind of helped, because every couple minutes there's a flash of lightning that made it fun to listen to. But one of the times the lightning goes off was like Corinthians, and I don't even know the verse, but it said something to the effect of that... Uh, um, you are God's temple and God dwells inside you. And had I not had the light switch turned on, had I not taken rooted, had I not had that class to really kick my into gear, I really would have never found the joy that it is to read this book and to have it in my life every day, whether I'm at the doctor, the dentist, or the DMV. Got time to read some Bible and it's all because of rooted. 
Thank you, Phil. Okay, we're going to do one more before I pray out. Last, um, last winter, uh, I, in response to a lot of people that said, would you please do a deeper dive in the scripture? I did a Revelation class, class for 13 weeks on Revelation. To my amazement, about 1,500 people zoomed in virtually to that class. And as we walked through Revelation, people said, this is really something that I've hungered for, is a really deep, careful study of a book of the Bible. So in keeping with that, uh, I asked the best theologian I know in this church, uh, Michelle Rader, if she would be willing to do a a follow-up to that, and it's the book of Romans, and Michelle's going to tell you a little bit about that. So I'm um, really excited about this opportunity to build on Richard's fantastic Revelation class as we do a deep dive into the other R book of the New Testament, Romans. And I'm also excited that another one of our elders, Glenn Vonk, is going to team up with me on that. He's taught many classes on our church in different areas and is just a great teacher. And throughout history, Romans has catalyzed conversion and renewal in the church. Great leaders like Augustine, Martin Luther, John Wesley, Karl Barth, all of them had significant conversion and renewal experiences reading through the book of Romans and receiving a fresh understanding of God's grace and mercy displayed in the life resurrection and death, death and resurrection of Jesus. And that understanding of what the gospel truly is, that it is the power of God, as Paul says in Romans 1, that it's something God has done for us, apart from any merit that we bring through our works or our birth or our social status, salvation by faith alone. This truth exploded through their life, their preaching, their writing out into the larger church and world in great revival. Bibles. And personally, I've been blessed to do an exegesis class of Romans twice, where we've gone through and um, translated from the Greek and then had great discussions with other pastors, Catholic, Protestant, black, white, Latino, just great diverse group of discussions as we've translated and read Romans together. And the first time that I did this, we were just going through a really tough period in our life personally, real financial challenges in our business, family challenges, just one of those um, periods where the hits just seem to keep coming and it's not just a week or two it's like month after month and as I was going through that time we came to Romans 4 which speaks of how Abraham looked at his dead almost dead body Sarah's almost dead body and against all hope Paul says he believed in the God who brings dead things to life And that was such a comfort to me in just that difficult time because there's always in this world something in our lives that is dying. And yet the message of Romans is that God is the God of life who brings the dead to life, who has brought us into new life. So I am just excited about this class and I invite you to join us in this journey to see what kind of revival and new life God is going to bring into our lives and our community as we go through this book together. So Glenn is going to be Michelle's sidekick, and I will tell you, I have listened to Michelle on Romans, and I learn. If you're ready for a deep dive, think about that one. So after the service, these classes are all going to be represented at tables right outside the front door. Just check it out. Just do yourself the favor. Say to God, what is my next right step? And check it out. So you know what? I've gone way over. You didn't know that, did you? But I have. But I asked the team, would you just do for me? Because midweek, it really hit me. This this really hit me. I said, um, there's an old gospel song that the older people in the crowd are going to know well. Would you just sing a couple stanzas? Then I'll pray us out. But just think about this. I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided 
to follow Jesus, no turn him back, no, no turn him back. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, oh no, no turning back. I have decided, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Man, I pray that for each of us. It'll be a, it'll be a ride, I promise. Let's pray. So, Lord, it's it's really. Uh, you know, we walk out now and we have to figure out what our next right step is. And it's going to be really easy to say to you, yeah, but what about this and what about them and what about that? And how am I going to do this? What is that to you? Jesus says, what is that to you? I'm asking you to trust me in the next right step. And then there'll be a next and a next. And it's a journey that's going to go all the way into eternity. So whether we're 24 or 94, Lord, we pray with all our heart that you would help us be a community of people who just keep taking the next right step. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Richard, for reminding us and challenging us that we all have a right next step in our relationship with Jesus. And we want to come alongside you, help you take a step of growth this fall. For those of you in person, we have tables outside. Take a look at the classes and support groups that are being offered. Richard did an amazing job highlighting those. Or check out damascus.com slash fall 2021. Register today. Don't wait. Take that right next step. Hey, if you're newer, stop by Guest Central here on campus. We have a gift bag. We'd love to get into your hands. Or if you're online, fill out that Connect card and a team, will, team member will reach out to you. Hey, big news about worship services next weekend. We're moving to two services. Anyone excited about that? More space for you, your family, your neighbors. So starting next Sunday, 9.30 and 11.15, children's ministry will be offered at the 9.30 and will be offered in the future at 11.15 as soon as we fill all of our serving positions. So more to come on that, but we are excited to see you next weekend. Don't miss one of the two services at 9.30 or 11.15. Have a great week.